Grace. And those of you that are visiting us for the first time, we are so glad to have you. We pray that you are blessed by the message this afternoon. We thank the Lord for, for providentially bringing you here to Way of Grace. We know that it was not an accident. God is in control of all events and circumstances, and we pray that he will bless you richly. We're in John chapter 20. If you haven't turned there, please turn over there with me. John chapter 20. You and I this afternoon are serving the most pivotal and most decisive, most crucial, and I would say the most important event in human history. What is it? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. If, if you never considered it, even our calendar system testifies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of the thousands of years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his incarnation would be summed up in two letters, B.C., right? And most of us know what B.C. stands for. B.C. stands for what? Before Christ. But after him, what is the time period? It goes from B.C. to what? A.D. But most people don't know what A.D. stands for. Anno Domini. Anno means year. Anno is the word that uh, where we get the English word annual. Annual. Many of our English words come from the Greek and the Latin. Annual is year. And Domini, where we get the word rule or dominion. So literally, our calendar system testifies that Jesus Christ has been ruling and reigning for 2,024 years. Even our calendar system tells us the truth of the gospel. It's really beautiful. And so the pivoting point between B.C. and A.D., the time before the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and that time period that you and I are living in now, the time of the resurrection or the gospel era, is predicated on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is most important. This is the most important thing for you and I to consider. If you open your bulletin, you can see the title at the top. Please open it. And the title is A First Day Consecrating Event. A First Day Consecrating Event. And we'll work our way through. And hopefully midway through the message, you'll understand why we titled this afternoon's <coughs> message such. But as we work our way through, I want to take you to uh, the first point in the outline. Now, there's 31 verses here. Our elder read all, ver all 31 verses here. Obviously, we won't have time to go through every verse here. But what I do want to do is have you pick up at right around verse 11. Right around verse 11. And this time period, this is, uh, again, during the time period of the Passover. It was at that Passover feast that our Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's table. And we've been uh, observing the Lord's table for over 2,000 years now to commemorate the reality that Jesus Christ is our Passover. We learned that on Friday, and it alluded to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus instituted that with his disciples, and then a couple of days later, actually on the third day, he rose again. And Peter and John and the women went to the tomb, the sepulcher, the sepulcher in verses 1 through 10. And Mary in verse 11 comes back to the tomb. And let's hone in on Mary. If you want to write this down, verse 11, this, there are several Marys in the New Testament, right? And sometimes we can kind of get confused going back and forth. Which Mary is that? If you want to write down Mary Magdalene, that's the Mary here. She's called Mary Magdalene because she was from the region of Magdala. Magdala, we looked at that on the map before. And it says in verse 11, I want to go all the way down through uh, verse 18, and that'll take us to our first point. <clears throat> Look at verse 11. Mary comes to the tomb with the women. That's how Matthew 28 depicts it. She leaves and she comes back. And here she is. It says, but Mary stooped without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus, past tense, had lain. That means he's not there, right? What does that imply? He rose again. He rose again. Verse 13, and they say unto her, that they is the angels, they said unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Why are you weeping? And she said unto them, because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. That's not quite how it happened. <laughs> She's doing the best that she can, though, right? She's doing the best that she can. And it says in verse 14, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus doing what? 
standing. That means he's not dead, but he's living. She turned around and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Hint, hint. Jesus did not reveal himself to her fully until he was pleased to reveal himself. So at this time, she saw a man who she supposed was a gardener. She saw a man that she supposed was a gardener, but she didn't realize yet that this was the resurrected Lord of glory. Okay? And so it says in verse 15, he said unto her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom seekest thou? And she supposing him to be the what? Gardener, which implies that you and I can never see Jesus for who he is unless he reveals himself to us. Has he revealed himself to you as the Lord of glory? It's his prerogative to both conceal himself and also reveal himself to whom he will. And so she says, sir, <clears throat> supposing he had been to garden, she says, sir, if you've borne him hints, if you've carried him somewhere, tell me where you have laid him and I'll take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, now he's revealing himself to her. He says her name in a very in a very in the very common tone that she was used to hearing him call her in. And immediately she recognizes who he is. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is interpreted master. That's what that means, master. And Jesus said unto her, and I want to park it here in verse 17 and talk to you about this for a few minutes. We can get verse 17. Up. <clears throat> Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God, and your God. Let's stop there for a minute. Does everybody see verse 17 there? So let me make a couple of comments about verse 17. It's very critically important that we understand what verse 17 is saying. Number one, I'm reading from the King James, and I realize that we have a lot of different uh, Bible versions out there, and that's cool. That's, that's fine. The King James did not do a very good job here. The King James could have done a little bit better job in explaining this verse. It should not be, don't touch me. It should be, do not hold on to me. That would be a better translation. That Greek term comes from the Greek term hapto, hapto, which means to fasten to or lay hold to. Okay. So number one, don't, don't let it get in your head that somehow Jesus was concerned about being contaminated after his resurrection. If she touched him, she was going to give him spiritual cooties or something like that. All right. Don't, don't think that. Remember, Jesus Christ had just bore an innumerable amount of sins for an innumerable amount of people. From every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation, he had become sin for his people. The last thing he was concerned about is being contaminated with the touch of Mary Magdalene. So that's not what it's talking about. And what he's saying is, do not hold on to me. Two things, if you want to write this down. What is the significance of Jesus saying here, don't touch me, don't hold on to me? Number one, I'll give you the lesser reason. And then number two, I'll give you the most significant reason. Number one, because Mary had a task. Mary had a task. Mary was called to take the news that Jesus Christ had risen again and go back and tell the other 12. She didn't have time to delay. She didn't have time to waste. She didn't have time to sit there and hold on to Jesus. She had to go tell the other 12. That's the first reason. But the second reason is even more important. The second reason is because Jesus, who is God and is able to read our thoughts and our intents, knew that, that Mary had a faulty understanding of the significance of the resurrection in that it was Mary's uh, likely assumption that Jesus would be raised again to just continue life as it was before he was crucified, as if he would just raise again and it would just be life as usual and he would continue to remain with her bodily and then just go on that way. What Mary didn't realize <clears throat> is this. It was critically important for Jesus not only to resurrect but to ascend Sin to send who? The third person who was always called a person, not an it in scripture. The Holy Ghost is a person. He's not a force, an it, or a power, or a feeling. He's a person, the third divine person of the Trinity. And it would be through the sending of the Holy Spirit that Mary would have an even better, more joyous, more comforting, comforting experience of Jesus Christ. Listen, not only with her, but where? In her. Not only with her, but in her. But it, so it was important that Jesus finish his work by revealing himself to the disciples for 40 days and then subsequently ascending to heaven so he could send a third person. That's what he's getting at here. That's why she can't hold on. And then he says something here very peculiar. We need to get this. He says, but go to my what? My brethren. What does that make Jesus to us? Our brother. Our older brother. Which implies what? If you're a believer, you're in God's family. You're in God's family. Isn't that good? 
before salvation, you are not in God's family. Before salvation, the Bible says you and I are children of wrath. The Bible would depict you and I as children of the devil before redemption. But because of the redeeming work of Jesus, the shedding of his blood, the redemption of Jesus, and the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, we are brought into the family. Therefore, God now is our God, and Jesus is our older brother. Listen, and our kinsman redeemer. And our kinsman redeemer. Because we know the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 25 and Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that the qualification for a kinsman redeemer is he had to be just that, a kinsman. He had to be bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. This is why Jesus had to become a man. Prior to Jesus being a man, he existed from all eternity as God, as God in heaven with the Father from all eternity. But he had to become a man in order to die in the place of men. He had to become a man in order to become the kinsman, redeemer, and elder brother of men. Does that make sense? Now, this is the other thing I want you to see here. Notice this. Jesus says, <clears throat> go to, uh, to my brethren. And say unto them, I ascend unto my what? My father and your father. See how we're in the family if we're a believer? And to my God and your God. Everybody see that there? So let me say two things about that. You want to write this down where he says, my father, that's Jesus' deity. When he says, my God, that's Jesus' humanity. You better get that. You want to get that. You want to get that. This a portion of scripture is not in any way uh, uh, demeaning. Or in any way denying the deity of Jesus Christ. When Jesus calls God his father, that's showing equality between the father and the son. When Jesus calls God the father his father, it's showing that they bear the same nature. When Jesus calls God his father, that is teaching you and I that Jesus is God. Can we get to John 5, 18? Just if you've never heard this before. To be the son of God is to be equal to God. I'm going to show you what a, what a Bible verse. To be the son of God is to be equal with God. Watch what it says in John 5, 18. We'll come right back. <clears throat> it says, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, kill Christ, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his what? Father, making himself what? Equal with God. See it? So we can go back. So when Jesus talks about God being his father, he's implying that he's equal. He's consubstantial and coessential. He bears the same nature as his daddy, which makes him equal to his daddy. But then he also calls God his God. That doesn't mean that Jesus is not God. It just means he was also a real man. Everybody get that? That's called the hypostatic union. Jesus was both God and man at the same time. Did everybody get that? He couldn't be your savior if he wasn't both God and man. Because only God could satisfy the wrath of God, but only a man can die in the place of men. Everybody get that? All right, so let's keep going. So there's a lot of theology in what Jesus just said to, to Mary here. Now, as we work our way through, <clears throat> notice what it says in verse 18. He says, Mary, it says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. She calls Jesus who? Uh, the Lord, right. And that he had spoken these things unto her. Who did Jesus choose to go to tell the disciples that he had risen? Mary Magdalene. So I want you to write this down. God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are not our ways. What I'm getting ready to say you right now is going to be challenging, but hopefully comforting too. Turn to Luke 8. Turn with me to Luke 8. It's commonly God's ways. It's commonly God's way to do a thing that we would consider counterintuitive. It's commonly God's way to do something that you and I would consider counterintuitive. What do you mean? As you go to Luke 8, God often uses despised means to get the job done. Did y'all know that? God commonly uses despised means to get the job done. Well, what do you say about that? Look at Luke 8. The same Mary, watch what it says about her. And, and if it was you and I, she would be the last person that we would send to deliver the message to the disciples. But she was the first person that God chose to use to send to the disciples. Look at Luke 8. It says, It came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. That's the twelve disciples. Look at verse 2. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called what? Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. He chose a demoniac woman. 
to bring the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to 12 disciples? Is that mind-blowing or what? And it shows us something about how God does things. His ways are not our ways, and his ways are infinitely above our ways. And he often operates in a counterintuitive way. Listen, if God always did things the way you thought he should do them, then he's not God. If he always fit in your nice little theological box and did things the way you thought he should do them, he wouldn't be God because he's not that small. He's not that small. He's infinite. He's incalculable. He's incomprehensible. He's an infinite being, and he's way above us way above us and therefore he does things that we just don't understand sometimes if you're in luke 8 go down to verse uh, 38 here's another one that'll blow your mind another demoniac and, and when we were in mark 5 we studied this guy this guy has six thousand demons in him y'all remember that we talked about that before and and notice what it says in verse 38 after jesus healed this demoniac from gadara and it says um now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him, or he begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, watch this, return to your own house and show how great things God has done unto thee. So in the way that Mark explains it is this man went all through the region of Decapolis preaching the gospel of Jesus. Check this out. Jesus sent him out to preach before he sent the 12 disciples out. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus sent this demoniac out to preach the gospel before he sent the 12 out. And he sent Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven demons out, to go tell the disciples before he sent the disciples out. I'm just showing you that oftentimes God's ways are not our ways. If we can get a Bible verse up, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 27, it shows us that God often uses despised means to get the job done in order that he'll get all the glory. In order that he'll get all the glory. Watch what Paul says here. <clears throat> but God has chosen the foolish things. Who are the foolish things here? Believers. Raise your hand. Believers. And you can read this in your own context. Verse 26 shows us the context. It's talking about elect people. Because he says in verse 26, he says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men, how that not many mighty or noble are called. So he's talking about people who are called. That he saves, washes, cleanses, and then uses. Washes, cleanses, and then uses. So it says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And then verse 28. I love how God works. And base things of the world and things which are what? Despised like Mary Magdalene and the demoniac and 12 fishermen who didn't even have a high school education to go preach the gospel and turn the world upside down. Has God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to not what? The things that are. That's just how God works. That's just how God works. God used the jawbone to kill a 1,000-man army. Did y'all know that? Some of you that read your Bible, don't turn there. You can look at it in your own time. Judges 15, 15. Great Samson. Great Samson. God gave him a donkey bone, and he killed a 1,000 men with a jawbone of a donkey. God often uses what we would consider foolish things. God used a tree for your salvation. God used a tree for your salvation. Not that we're worshiping a piece of wood. We worship the Son of God who hung on that piece of wood. And yet the tree was a means by which our Savior redeemed us. Is that true? That's right. And God uses sinners that he saves and regenerates to go out and preach. God used the lowly Lord Jesus Christ who grew up in the hood, didn't he? He grew up in Richmond, I mean in Nazareth, in a poverty-stricken part of town. Remember the disciple says, nothing good comes out of Nazareth except the Son of God, right? And he used him mightily. I want to say this to you too. I want you to get this in your notes. Through the gospel, God leveled the playing field between men and women. Let me touch on this for a minute. Go back to our text. God leveled the playing field. In this time, in the Roman Empire, the women at this time were demeaned. They were belittled. They were looked at as insignificant. They were uh, uh, considered as nothing less than chattel. But the gospel honored women. The gospel raised up women. The gospel blessed women so much so that in Jesus Christ, positionally, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're all what? One in Christ Jesus. This is why Jesus could easily tell Mary Magdalene to go tell the 12. Isn't that beautiful? You women should be 
saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So the gospel leveled it out. The Roman culture had tipped tipped the scales by which women were belittled and demeaned. But the gospel levels it out. This is so beautiful. But it's important that you get this. The gospel doesn't tip it the other way either, sisters. Beware of the perilous pendulum. Beware of the perilous pendulum. The pendulum at one time swung in one way by which our sisters were belittled and demeaned. And then now in our culture it swung the other way by which we are engaging in male bashing and hating men and calling it toxic masculinity. Don't you ever be a part of that. Don't you ever listen to the enemy by which he would deceive you into bashing your male brothers. Don't ever do it. Because God made them both male and female. To bash the opposite sex is to bash God. That's important that we say that. That's important that we say that. So no, Mary Magdalene is not called to be a pastor. And this a portion of scripture is not endorsing women being called to be pastors in the pulpit. But what it is saying is that God is calling men and women equally to witness and evangelize and share the gospel. That means all of us have that commission from Jesus to take the gospel out to a lost dying world. Amen. That's exactly what it's saying. But just remember, two wrongs don't make a right. That's important. Let's keep it moving. Um, the other thing I want you to see is point two. Let's kind of slow down here. I love this. Look at point two in your outline. We're back in John 20 in our home text. <clears throat> point two, it says the foundational precedent for the New Testament church's Sunday. The New Testament Sunday church worship and gathering. What am I saying? There's a precedent. There's a reason why we're here today. Why we're having church today and not on Saturday. I'm going to talk to you about that for a few minutes. Why we're having church today as the primary day of worship and not Saturday or Tuesday or some other day during the week. We have Bible study other, other days during the week, too. I encourage you guys to come to all the services, Tuesday, 730, Friday, 730, and Sunday at 130. But the word of God would demonstrate to us that Sunday, listen, the first day of the week, according to the scriptures, is the primary day of worship. And before we turn in here, I want, I want you to see in your text. You guys are in John 20, right? Go to John 20, verse 1. <clears throat> I'm going to show you three verses in the same text before we look at other passages. Okay, John chapter 20, it says, look at the first three words, what? The first day. Okay, the first day. What's the first day on the calendar? Sunday. Okay, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was dark unto the sepulcher and sees the stone uh, taken away from the sepulcher. We know that that's because Jesus rose. So verse 1, it says the first day. Go to verse 19. Verse 19, it says, then the same day. So what day is that? First day. The same day at evening being the what? First day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. The doors are shut because the disciples are afraid of the Jews coming and, and crucifying them as well. But it says this first day, the disciples were assembled. That's a precedent, folks. The first day of the week, the disciples are gathering together and they're assembled. Now, we know that they were very likely talking about the different things that transpired, the sufferings of Christ and talk of, remember, Jesus said he would raise again the third day. And, and we know that they would have been engaged in a form of worship on this, this first day of the week as well. There's no doubt about that. But I want you to see when this was the first day. And then if that's not enough for you, look at verse 26. And after eight days. That would be Sunday again. That would be counting Sunday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you have three verses back to back to back in the same chapter that shows us the disciples are choosing to gather together on that first day. And after eight days again, his disciples were within. So the disciples are together again. That's a precedent. So look on your outline. Why does the church gather on the first day of the week? Well, number one, we have a precedent in Scripture. We're not just pulling this out of the air. Number two, you have the word commendation, right? Everybody see your outline? It should be commemoration. But commendation is important, too, because we have the New Testament uh, actually commending this day as the important and special day of gathering. But the word I want you to write down, please, in your notes is commemoration. Every Sunday, not just today. Listen to me. Every Sunday is a commemoration of Jesus' resurrection. Did you know that? In fact, every day you wake up is a commemoration of the resurrection. Every day you wake up, you should wake up, your eyes open, you should say, thank you, Jesus, for waking me up. 
every day. But every day, that's a reflection and a picture of the Son of God who raised again from the sleep of the grave. And because he raised, we wake up every day. And one day we will wake up in heaven because Jesus atoned for our sins. Does that make sense? But, but particularly every Sunday we come together, that's a commemoration of the resurrection. Every Sunday we're being reminded that our Savior rose again on that day. So that's the next one. The other one, it says, the other reason we come together this day is because Scripture teaches it. Scripture. So turn with me to Acts 20. I want you to see another place in the Bible. And this has way less to do with church history and much more to do with Scripture. Your ultimate uh, uh, guideline by which you determine what you should do and should not do is not church history. It's the Bible. It's not the church fathers. Okay, it's not creeds and confessions. It's the Bible. The Bible is the highest authority in the universe. For the Christian, the Bible is God's constitution. Yeah, look at Acts chapter 20. You guys here? Look at verse 6. Paul is in Troas. Paul is in Troas and he's meeting the saints. Verse 6, it says, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. This is what the Jews were observing. It's not saying the Christian church was observing that. It's just giving us a time frame. And it says, and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. And upon the what? There it is again. The first day of the week just happens to be today. It says, when the disciples came together to what? They're coming together to worship. They're observing Lord's table and they're worshiping. They're worshiping on this day because we have a precedent. Okay, and, and the breaking of bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continued in speech until midnight. I told you, you guys think I preach long. Paul preached all day and all night. That brother preached all day and all night. Go to 1 Corinthians 16. Let me show you another. Because I want you to know this, not because your pastor said it, but because God says it in his word. The ultimate authority is not your pastor. It's the Bible. We need to know what it says. So you guys in 1 Corinthians 16, <clears throat> what Paul is referring to here is the collection that he was taken for the Jewish churches in Judea from the churches of Macedonia and then the church at Corinth to, to uh, uh, gather together a collection for the poor churches in Jerusalem. I notice when he says in verse one, it says now concerning the collection for the saints, I have given order to the what churches of Galatia. Even so do ye upon what? Why would he set aside a collection on the first day if that wasn't the day the church came together? You ain't getting a good collection if you do that, right? You're going to do it on the first day when everybody comes together. So you can have something to give to the poor brethren in Judea. So he says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. In other words, it will all be gathered and sent to those churches that were in need. Can I get Revelation 1 up? We're going to turn to one more place. Stay in Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians 4. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to get Revelation 1, 10 on the overhead. And momentarily, we are going to go develop Revelations 1 shortly. We are going to be turning there, but just not yet. We're turning to 1 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> so what I'm laying before you is reasons why we gather on the first day of the week. Number one, there's a precedent in Scripture because we have a commendation from the Scriptures. We have a commemoration shown in Scriptures. And because the scripture teaches it. And here's another reason, if you're if you're keeping track with me, because you and I have what I call apostolic exemplification, because we have apostolic exemplification. What do you mean? Because the apostles are modeling it. That's what I mean. You, everybody get that? The apostles are modeling it. Paul says in first Corinthians chapter four. If you guys are in first uh, Corinthians chapter. Four, let's see here. I'm in chapter three. OK, look at chapter four. Paul says, wherefore, I beseech you, be ye what? Followers of what? Y'all with me? First Corinthians four. Sixteen. Is everybody there? He says, wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of who? You know what he's saying? What you see me doing what? Do. Paul had authority from who? Jesus. So when was Paul gathering the churches together on the first day of the week? So to, to not do that is to not be subject to the apostolic authority that Jesus gave Paul. Therefore, it would, to be not, it would be to not do that would be to not be subject to the authority of Jesus Christ. That's a very important thing, and I don't think we want to do that. One more, Revelation chapter 1. 
Revelation chapter 1. Yes, we have rich church history by which the church for 2,000 years has been gathering together, the Christian church, on the first day of the week. But I'm taking to you to a more important, more, more important precedent, which is the Bible that teaches this. Watch what, watch what uh, John says here in Revelation 1.10. <clears throat> John says, I was in the spirit when? On the Lord's day. That's Jesus' day. That's the first day of the week. Remember, Jesus said he's the Lord of the Sabbath, isn't he? That's right. Right. So the Lord's Day here would be that first day of the week that he's referring to. I'm going to go back and momentarily and develop this so you can see it. But I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. We'll develop that momentarily. But I just wanted you to be able to see from multiple places in the Bible that what we are doing is biblical and it's right and just for us to do it. Go back to John 20 and let's jump down to 2A, please. Please go back to John 20. What, what would be the implications of not worshiping on Sunday as the primary day of worship? Now, can we worship God all the other days during the week? Of course. If you're a true believer, you can't help but worship God. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right? We're not to be Sunday-only worshipers. We're not to be, if we're Sunday-only worshipers, we're not true worshipers of the true and the living God. Right. It, it, it's... It's the core of who we are. If we've been regenerated, it should be every day. But Sunday is a special day. Why is it not Saturday? Does everybody see 2A on their outline? Why Saturday is not the day? Several reasons. Number one, I just showed you in scripture. But number two, think with me now. Why Saturday is not the day? Number one, it would be a denial of the resurrection. It would be a denial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If, if, if the church was to think about it after the resurrection, to continue to say, no, Saturday is the day, that would be an implicit uh, denial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who through his resurrection, listen, put away the old and establish the new. It would be a denial that the old covenant was only to be temporary and it was vanishing and fading away, according to Hebrews 8, and that the New Testament was being instituted. It would be a denial of that. Why is that dangerous? It would be to make us enemies of Christ. It would be to make us enemies of Christ. To continue to, to rear up and solidify the old covenant when Jesus died to put it away. So number one, it would be a denial of his resurrection because he rose the first day. Moreover, according to Colossians 2, it would be a denial of the Sabbath day's shadow. It would be a denial of the Sabbath day's shadow. Did you know that the Sabbath day in the Old Testament was only a shadow? It was not the reality. Think about it. How many of them Jews in the Old Testament kept Sabbath days and still died and went to hell? Did you guys hear what I said? The large majority of those Jews in the Old Testament kept the Sabbath day and still died and went to hell. That couldn't have been the ultimate reality in itself because it didn't save them. There must be something greater than a Sabbath day. There is. It's the Sabbath person. Jesus is the Sabbath. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Does that make sense? All right. We didn't get it up here? Now we need to, okay. Colossians 2.16, many of us know this already, but look, he says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day. Don't let anybody judge you in respect of a holy day. You got to keep this day, you got to keep that day and the other day. Paul says, no, no, no. Or of the new moon or of the what? Sabbath days, look at the next verse, Sabbath days, Sabbath days, Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Would you hug a shadow or a person? I hope you don't hug shadows. That'd be kind of weird, huh? Right. Don't let anybody catch you embracing shadows, right? Well, if you do that, look at my arms. That just means you need to be in a straight jacket. That's what that means. We need you to take you to the inside asylum. The Sabbath day was only a shadow that pointed to a fulfillment in a person. To deny the person and to embrace the shadow would be utter religious insanity. The other thing that I want you to know this is if to continue to make Saturday, the seventh day, the ultimate day of worship is to fail to move from the old covenant to the new covenant. And what's the danger of that? It would make you an Old Testament Christian rather than a New Testament Christian. Now you're not under grace, you're under law. Now you're not under grace, you're under law. And the Bible says in Romans uh, 4, 15, that the law works wrath. 
All the law can do is condemn you. It can never forgive you. It can never save you. You don't ever want to be under that kind of system because you can't be forgiven. The other thing that is making Saturday the ultimate day of worship is, and this is probably maybe even the biggest danger, it's a seeking righteousness by law keeping. It's seeking righteousness by law keeping. Now, Romans 10, 4 makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the end of the law. Jesus Christ is the end of the law. You can't hold on to Jesus and also hold on to the law, too. You can't do it. Notice what it says. For Christ is the what? End of the law. For righteousness to everyone that what? That means Jesus is the, the aim and purpose of the law. That word there, uh, in teleos. The, 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 the purpose of the law is to point you, listen, to point you away from itself to a saving person, which is Christ. It would be spiritual suicide to try to hold on to the law for salvation. Spiritual suicide. Yep. The other reason is, as you all turn to 1 Corinthians 15, I need you to see this, please. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. The other reason that you and I today in the church, if you ever wonder why the primary day of worship for us is Sunday... And all sound gospel Christian churches all over the world today is Sunday. Because guess what? If you read your Bible carefully, how many of you have read the whole Old, uh, New Testament? Just making sure you're awake. Y'all with me? I know it's warm in here. We should open the windows or something. It's kind of hot in here, okay? I had to turn the heater off early. I don't want people to melt. Okay? If you, listen, those of you that raise your hand, are you accountable? If you've read through the whole New Testament, Tell me how many times you've seen in the New Testament, particularly in the epistles, where the New Testament church was worshiping on Saturday. It's not there. It's not there. That means it's not scriptural. That means we don't have a biblical warrant to do it. But you see the church coming together on the first day of the week. Okay, so we have a biblical reasoning for it. Now, if you're in 1 Corinthians 15, what we're doing on the first day, particularly today, is what event are we celebrating, saints? The resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus. Now, why is the resurrection important? This might be the most important part of the message because we know that he rose. But many of us don't know why it was why it's so critically important to our salvation that he rose. I want you to know this before you leave today. Now, if you're in first Corinthians 15, please go to verse 12. There were some people in the Corinthian church saying that Jesus didn't raise. So Paul had to get in their case. OK, so if you're in first Corinthians 15, uh, Paul says, he says, now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. If there's no resurrection, that means Jesus didn't raise. If Jesus didn't raise, then we in big trouble. <laughs> Listen, did y'all know that if Jesus didn't ra didn't raise. We're wasting our time here today. We're wasting our time. And the Bible is not to be trusted if Jesus didn't raise. And our faith in going to heaven would be a false faith if Jesus didn't raise. All of Christianity hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing. It's the most important thing. And then it says here, verse 14, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching what? I shouldn't even be up here preaching. And your faith is what? You shouldn't even be out there believing. Verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God that I'm a liar of God if Jesus didn't raise. See how important the resurrection is? Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. That would be making God a liar. Verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, look at this. Your faith is what? And you are yet in your what? That means we all going to hell. That makes the resurrection pretty special now. Huh? Right. That makes the resurrection pretty important now, doesn't it? Then they which also are fallen asleep in Christ are what? Perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men what? Most miserable. But we can flip that because he did raise again. And because he did raise, we're guaranteed to raise. And because he did raise, we know that we're justified from all sins. And if he did raise, our faith is true. And we no longer have any sins to be accounted for because Christ paid for them in full, in totality. Does that make sense? 
then we're standing here. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are justified in the sight of God. Past sins, present sins, future sins, all sins have been washed away by the blood. That's what God says. That's what God says. And just so you know this, that Jesus' resurrection was not merely viewed by a couple, uh, two or three or four people in a dark corner of the world. Oh, listen, listen. Over 500 people saw Jesus after his resurrection. Over 500 people saw Jesus after his resurrection. There's forensic, forensic evidence that can stand in a test in a court of law. Well, where do you get that in the Bible? Thank you for asking. Go to verse 6. <clears throat> Go to verse 6. Talking about his resurrection, it says, After that, he was seen of above who? Five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains unto this present. He says, and most of them still alive. You can go, you can go ask them. You can go talk to them. Okay? They saw him. They drank coffee with him. They ate broiled fish and, and honeycomb with him. They saw that he really raised again. So we have a solid grounds to base our faith. This is why the resurrection is critical for us. Go back to our text. Because Jesus raised, let me give you another word. And go back to John 20. Because Jesus raised, you and I, if you're a believer, we are acquitted from all of our sins. Now, if you are here today and you are not trusting Christ, you are under the wrath of God right now. Listen to me. If you came in today, and I don't know your heart, only God knows your heart. But if you came in today and you don't know Christ and you're not believing the gospel, you are right now, John 3, 36, you are right now under God's wrath at any moment. Right now you are suspended on a spider web of God's mercy. And at any moment he could pull your card and you could plummet down the abyss into hell. Because Jesus is broad as the way and wide as the gate that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in there at. But if you receive this message today, and you call on the Lord Jesus Christ from the heart. You don't even have to come to the front of the church. This is not the altar. It's just a piece of wood. You come to Christ by faith from your heart without even having to move your feet. Nobody has to see it. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to say anything to another person. You can call on Jesus from your heart. You can whisper in the deep, remote recess of your heart and say, Lord Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, save me. Save me from my sins, oh God. And he hears that prayer. He already died to pay for your sins. You have to repent and put your trust and confidence in Jesus Christ. And the work is done. There's no work for you to do. He's already done the work. He's already done the work. Isn't that good? Look at this. He that believes on the Son of God, not will, has, present tense, has what? Everlasting life. And he that believes not the Son. Shall not see light. That person's not going to heaven if they don't believe on Jesus. But the wrath of God abides on him. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to any of us, is it? Today is the day of salvation. Believe on Jesus Christ before you leave this building. You and I are not guaranteed to make it through this day, are we? Believe on him while you still have breath in your lungs. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. All right, now I want you to see something else which is really beautiful. I hope you guys are back in John uh, 20. Look at point number three. The benefits accrue to your soul through first day weekly gathering. What are the benefits that are accrued to our soul? What's the benefit of us coming together for worship on the first day of the week? Let's see if I can show you. Look at verse 19, please. John 20. <clears throat> verse 19. It says, the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were what? That's important. The doors are shut. The doors are closed. Why? They're afraid of the Jews. They, they don't want to be taken and killed like their master was. So they're in hiding. They're gathered together, but the doors are closed. The curtains probably closed and everything, right? Watch them. The doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Came Jesus and stood in the midst. Y'all see that there? And said unto them, peace be unto thee. Look at it again. The same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto them. Now somebody tell me how Jesus got into the room and nobody opened the door. Don't say it out loud. The doors are shut. Did the text say that? 
the doors are shut. All of a sudden, Jesus just enters into the room. Okay? Now, if that's not enough, he did it twice. Go down to verse 26. It says, and after eight days, his disciples were where? Within. And, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors what? Being shut and stood in the midst of them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of them. Peace be unto thee. What do we have here, folks? The doors are closed. And somehow Jesus enters into the building. How do we explain that? Jesus walked through the wall. He walked through the wall or walked through the door. What we have is a preternatural event. We have a preternatural event where Christ, as a result of his resurrection, has now received a spiritual body that the Apostle Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This should mean something to you because if you're a believer, you're going to get one too. Yeah, you're going to get one too. Believers will be able to walk through walls as well. How does a physical body walk through a physical wall unhindered? It's a mystery, isn't it? But we have at least a foretaste of the coming glory of Jesus and the glory of our new resurrected glorified bodies when we raise again on the last day. I love it. I love it. And now Jesus is no longer limited by the uh, physical laws of physics of the old world. But because remember, when Jesus comes back, he's going to make a new what? And a new what? Wherein dwells what? A new world means new laws. The old world has particular laws of physics. Those of you that went to school and, and you learned biology and you learned chemistry and you learned physics, there are certain uh, inviolable laws that cannot be violated in this world. But in the new world, then there will be new laws. And therefore, this is why Jesus was able to just walk through a wall or just disappear and reveal himself or conceal himself when he wanted to. It's really beautiful. And it's a foreshadow of the glory to come, not only of Christ, but of his people also. Now, I want to get up Luke 24, 39, because Luke 24, 39 shows this amazing event. Jesus, now let me see the Avengers do something like that. <laughs> yeah, let me see the Avengers. Iron Man can't do that. Thor can't do that. The Incredible Hulk can't do that, can he? Jesus just walked through the walls like, what y'all want to do, right? And you, you, you imagine how shocked they must have been when they're gathered in, all the doors are locked and bolted shut, and they're praying, and they look up, and Jesus just standing there. They're like, whoa, right? But guess what? They didn't see a phantom. What they did not see was an apparition. What they did not see is a dossier. What they saw was a bodily resurrected God-man who had a real body, flesh and bones, that's important because your Gnostic heresy and your Muslims and other groups out there will say Jesus did not raise bodily. Your Jehovah Witnesses and Watchtower, they deny the bodily resurrection. If you deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved. That's cardinal Christian doctrine. And if Christ didn't raise, like we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, you and I ain't raising. Yeah, but he did raise. Now watch this, Luke 24, 39. It's the same account in Luke. Jesus walks in. He says, hey, fellas, if you don't really believe it's me, behold my what? What's it say? What's it say? My hands. My hands. Kedos. Kedos is the Greek term for hands. Listen, it's never translated wrists. I looked up like 25 different translations before I got up here. It's never translated wrists. Kedos is always translated hands. He was pierced with nails through his hands, as the scripture has said. As the scripture has said. So he says, I want you to see that it's really me. Touch my hands and check my feet. Behold, that it is I myself. Handle me. It means touch me and see. Look, for a spirit has not flesh and blood, right? Good. You're paying attention. It doesn't say blood. Stay awake. This is important. This is the heart of the gospel. It doesn't say blood on purpose. He says flesh and bones because there's no more blood in him because he poured it all out at the cross. That's a full payment for sins. All the blood came out. That means all our sins are washed away. That's why it says that. Y'all get that? That we learned something in church today, didn't we? Right. Flesh and bones as you see me have. And if he has flesh and bones, that means he's not a spirit or a phantasm. He's a real bodily resurrected person. They had proof. Look at the next verse. Look at the next verse. Go ahead and put the next verse up there because this is important to, to see the reality. 
He says, and, and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And then look at the next verse. And while they yet believed not for joy. While they what? Believed not for joy. They're just like me and you got weak faith. Right? Listen, the disciples didn't have large, awesome, Superman, gargantuan faith. Forget it. It's nowhere in the Bible. They had weak faith just like your pastor, just like you. But God saves people with weak faith. You don't have to have large faith. You just have to have a large Savior. You just need a large Savior. Jesus says you only need faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed. So why are people boasting about how big their faith is? Right? Why are they boasting about how big their faith is? They should be boasting about how big their Savior is. Yeah. That's right. And that's why we don't call him Doubting Thomas. You don't find any Bible verse that says Doubting Thomas. You don't. That's a bad interpretation of the scripture. Yes, Thomas struggled with faith, but the other 12 struggled with faith too. They all did. Right, so we ain't going to beat up. If we got to beat up on Thomas, we got to beat up on us and the other 11. All right. It says, while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, hey, y'all got anything to eat? That's my translation. <laughs> That's not like me. Huh? Y'all got something to eat? Now look at the next verse. And they gave him a piece of broil fish and of honeycomb. Look at the next verse. And he took it and ate it before him. He's not a spirit. That's a real man. A spirit ain't eat no fish, right? He ate the fish and the honeycomb right in front of them to show that he really rose bodily and that we too will raise bodily because our master did. Y'all see it? Is that beautiful? Let me hurry up. All right. So hope you guys are in John 20. Um, so let me run through these letters real quick. Why is first day worship important? Look at 3A on your outline. 3A on your outline. Christ reveals himself to us on that day. That doesn't mean he doesn't reveal himself to us on other days. So I'm going to challenge you right now. I'm going to challenge you right now. Because I want to have you like maybe 10 or 15 more minutes. And we got some good food for you in there. But we're eating spiritual food now. Just hang in there with me a little bit longer. I, 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 I hope and pray that you read your Bible during the week. I hope and pray. I'm encouraging you to. You shouldn't just open your Bible on Sunday. Okay. But I guarantee you that the large majority of the time you receive special revelations from God out of the Bible when you come to church and listen to the preaching even more than you do when you just read on your own. I guarantee it. I'm not saying that God doesn't reveal his word to you when you're on your own. I know he does. We praise God for that. We say, Lord, help me to understand my reading and bless it to me. And he does. Isn't he faithful? He blesses us during the week when we read. But there's a special revelation of Jesus Christ on the first day of the week when the saints are gathered together in a way that you don't normally experience it when you're on your own. That's just the way God set it up. It pleased God. I'm giving you a Bible verse. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's just how God works. And so this is why we have to, yeah, there's right there. For the preaching of the cross and to them that perish foolish, but unto us the saviors is the power of God. Can we get up verse 21? It's verse 21. And we're going to go to Revelation real quick. Yeah, it says, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That means you're not going to heaven without a preacher. You will not be saved without a preacher. That doesn't necessarily means, have to always mean a pulpit preacher. That just means somebody who knows the gospel. It can be at the gym. It can be in the grocery store. It can be at the park. It can be on your walk. It doesn't matter. That somebody who knows Christ communicates the gospel to you that you be saved. God always uses human means. God will always use human means. How shall they hear without a? Romans 10, right? Good. Okay, now let's do this. Please turn to Revelation chapter 1, please. Revelation chapter, you uh, know what? Don't, no, no, stay there. Let me, let me show you something real quick here. This first day of the week, we're in John 20 first. It was this first day that Jesus showed up and revealed himself, okay? If you're in John 20, look with me. Back at verse 19 again, it says, <clears throat> in the same day at evening being the first day of the week, that first day of the week, their saints are gathered together. When the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came who? Jesus. Mm -hmm. And stood in the midst and said unto them, peace be unto thee. When did, he, when did he reveal himself to them? The first day of the week when they were gathered together. Look at verse 26. After eight days again, his disciples were within. They're gathered together again. On the first day. And Thomas 
uh, with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, said, Peace be unto thee. When is he revealing himself to them? When they're gathered together for worship on the first day of the week. Y'all see it in the scripture, right? Now go to Revelation 1. Jesus chose to give the Apostle John, that's who wrote the book of Revelation, was the Apostle John. He chose to give him a special revelation of himself, not on any other day during the week primarily, but the first day. And I'm going to condense this, but look at verse 9, please. Revelation 1, 9. We're in the book of the apocalypse. That's what revelation means, apocalypse. And this is the vision Jesus gave him at Patmos. Look at, at Patmos. Look at verse 9. And I, he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was, he was persecuted. That's why he was sent there. Verse 10. I was in the what? Spirit on the what? That's how you and I ought to come to church. So we ought to pray before we come. Lord, help me to come to church in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because we can come to church in the flesh, right? And tear stuff up. Can't we? You can come to church in the flesh and tear stuff up. This is why you got to pray before you come to church. Did you pray before you came here today? Don't, don't say anything. Just think in your heart. Did you pray? I guarantee you there were people who came in today didn't pray before they came. Please pray before you come to church. Ask God to help you to come to church in the spirit and not in the flesh. Okay? Otherwise, we're not ready to hear from God and worship God. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's the first day of the week, folks. That's not judgment day. That's not talking about judgment day at all here. This is not judgment day at all. You can't get that from looking at this verse even for, for, for two minutes. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. That's Christ speaking behind him. With his powerful authoritative voice saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turn to see the what? Now, how do you see a voice? Y'all sit with me. How do you see a voice? Unless it's the word of God incarnated in his post-resurrected glorified manner. He's seeing the glorified God. And this is not judgment day. He's seeing the glorified Savior at the right hand of God on the first day of the week. That should be your prayer when you come to church. Lord, help me to see your glory in the finished work and exalted status of the Son of God when I come to church. Help me to see him high and lifted up in all his redemptive glory. Isn't that right? And I turned to see the voice that spake with me in being turned. See, repentance is you being turned. Being turned. That's in the passive. I turned because I was being turned. I saw seven golden candlesticks. I wish I had time to go through the whole chapter right here. I'm going to go through one more verse. Then he said, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, the seven candlesticks of the seven churches here. One like unto who? The son of man clothed with a what? Garment down to the foot. Son of man underscores his deity and his messiahship. Clothed with a garment down to the foot. He's the exalted king priest. And gird about the paps with a golden girdle because he's our high priest. That's, that's girdle, uh, high priest attire. His head and his hairs were white like wool. It didn't just say his hair was white like wool. Okay? It says his head. It doesn't say his hair was nappy. There are a lot of people that take that verse to see Jesus was African-American because he said he had hair like wool. That means his hair was nappy. That's not what the text is saying. Just slow down and read the text. Okay? Write it down. This, I know we're laughing, but I want to his hair is white. This is symbolic. It's not literal. His hair is white means he's the ancient of days. It underscores his eternality. He's very God of very God. He's existed from all eternity. The Proverbs talk about the hoary head being a crown of righteousness. Okay, that's what it means. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has to do with eternality. All right. His head, his head and his hairs were white like wool. So he can't be African-American because he got a white head too. Right? Did you see that? He got a white head. It's symbolic. He's ancient. He's the ancient of days. He's very God of very God. His head and his hair is white like wool, as white as snow, 
and his eyes were as a flame of fire. That's an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-penetrating, all-scrutinizing, all-discerning eye. He knows all things. What omni is that, children of God? Omniscience. He knows it all, right? All right. And it says his feet like unto brass, as if they burned in a furnace. The furnace, he, write it down, his feet, again, it's not talking about his ethnicity. His feet are like burnished brass because he went through the fire of the wrath of God for our sins and came out on the other side. That's what it symbolizes. Okay, didn't he raise again from the grave? Right. And, uh, and then it says in his voice as the sound of many waters and then it goes on. All right, so we're running out of time. Go back to our text. Go back to our text. I'm just going to throw these things at you. Go back to John chapter 20. This is so important. One of the benefits accrued to you the first day of the week for worship and gathering is, is one word. Ready? Peace. Most people today don't have peace. And they go to the doctor. Or they go to the psychiatrist. They go to the psychologist. They, they, they go the pharmaceutical route. Right. And they're looking for all sorts of ways. They think if they get the right person in the White House or the right political party or they just work things out with their neighbors. Or if they get the right possession, if they just get into more money and they can get this, that and the other thing and they get it and they still don't have any peace because peace is a person. The only place you're going to have ultimate peace in your soul is to know Jesus Christ. Listen, nothing can give you peace like knowing you're not going to hell anymore. That's good, isn't it? For God to tell you through the gospel, you are no longer under my wrath. You were going to hell, but now you're headed to heaven. That makes your worst day your best day, doesn't it? Right. And only Jesus can give you that peace as a person. But when you forsake the gathering together of God's people, you forfeit peace. That's real easy. Look at the text back in John 20, verse 19, when Jesus showed up, look at the last sentence in verse 19. What did he say unto them? Peace be unto thee, right? Everybody see that? Okay. And go down again to verse 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, what? Peace be unto thee. Go to verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst of them and said, what? Peace be unto thee. See it? He said it three times there because we usually don't get it the first time. Right. So he says it a second and a third time. This peace is important because it implies the finished work of the cross. It's a vertical peace. Ultimately, it's a vertical peace between them and God. That they're no longer under the wrath of God. Now they have peace with God because of the propitiatory work of Jesus. Because he died in their place and shed his blood. They don't have to go to hell. Isn't that good news? So it's redemptive peace. It's, it's, it's salvific peace. That only Jesus can give you. And guess what? When you come together for the preaching of the gospel on Sunday, if you're a child of God. Guess what the Spirit of God whispers in your soul when you hear the gospel? Peace, 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 peace between you and God. Now notice verse 21. Then said Jesus unto them, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Powerful. That means you and I have a similar commission to Jesus. In the same way God the Father sent Jesus in the world, God the Son sends you and I into the world. Is that awesome or what? To preach to a lost, dying world, right? Now, verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them. See that there? He breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the what? What does that mean? Only Jesus can give you the Holy Ghost. That means your pastor cannot lay hands on you and give you the Holy Ghost. Right? Only Jesus can give you the Holy Ghost. Now, I ain't breathing on none of y'all. At least I'm going to try not to, especially if I have some coffee. All right. But my breath cannot impart the Holy Ghost to you. Only the Son of God's breath can. That means he's God. Listen, this is good. Only God can give you God. Got it? Only God can give you God. Only the second person can give you the third person. 
But what else can we learn from this? I want you to write down one word, Pentecost. Let me help you with this verse. When Jesus breathes on them and says, receive you the Holy Ghost, you want to get this. This is what we call a token and a foreshadow of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost a few days later at Pentecost. That's exactly what's happening here. Did everybody get that? What we have here is a foreshadow and a token of the outpouring of the Spirit of God, which would be poured on them at Pentecost. Acts 1.8, if we can get that up, don't turn there because we, we're going to wrap up. Acts 1.8, just put it up on the overhead. This is a foreshadow. What he's saying is just be patient and wait until you be empowered by the Spirit from on high. This is a foreshadow of that. How comforting and refreshing would that breath have been, though? Don't you love when, when, you, when you're struggling and you feel like giving up and God gives you a cool, refreshing breath of grace? To cool you and refresh you, to give you grace to continue going so you don't fall away in apostate. Guess where he primarily breathes that cool, refreshing breath on you? Through the gospel, through the preaching of the gospel. This is why so many believers are so weary and tired and hot and ready to give up because they've been forfeiting this cool, refreshing breath of grace through the preaching of the gospel because they ain't been with the saints in a long time. That's right. Why are you so hot, brother? You, you ain't been under the gospel. Why are you so hot, sister, sweating it all? That ain't hot flashes. You ain't been under the gospel. You need to be under the gospel so you can get cooled down. Yeah. Watch this. He says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Because Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. But you got to wait until the Spirit comes down. That's what the breath was foreshadowing, okay? So I hope we got that. If there's questions after, I'll be the last one here. Don't leave. You got questions? Talk to me after. Let's chat, okay? Because I want us to know Christ. I want us to know the gospel. So uh, let us see. When we gather together with the saints the first day of the week, your commission and purpose is clarified. I won't go to the, that verse. You can see it. Jesus told them, I'm sending you out. Any of you, if you're wondering what your purpose and calling in life is, when you don't gather with the saints under the preaching of gospel, uh, under the preaching of the gospel, what you were doing is you were staying away and keeping yourself away. For, listen, from the primary way that God reveals that to you. Think about how many times you've come to church on Sunday and be like, oh, the pastor was talking to me and I don't know what you're going through. Right. You've come in and you've heard something in the message and God has given you an answer out of the text. Or he's spoken to you by way of affirmation or conviction or encouragement or something. And God has a way of speaking to his people in a special revelatory way through the preaching of the gospel. In a way you miss when you stay away from the saints. When you stay away from the preaching of the gospel. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. You want to know what you're... What your purpose is in life and what God's will is for you, get under the preaching of the gospel. And I guarantee he'll make it clear to you. Letter D, there is Holy Ghost empowerment and affirmation when you're under the preaching. This is what we just saw an allusion to. I'll make it simple. The Holy Ghost reveals that you belong to God when you're under the preaching. If you're a child of God, he confirms your soul. The spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we're God's children, doesn't he? All right. Letter E, we only have three letters left. Letter E. Real simple, your faith is increased. Okay, put up Galatians 3.1. When you're under the gospel, your faith is increased. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by? Now, look at this text here. Paul sent to the Galatians who were uh, so quickly moved away from the gospel. And, and, and I, I struggle when I see believers so easily moved away from the hope of the gospel by new teachings and new doctrines which are not the gospel. It troubles me. It burdens my heart. When I see it, but the Galatians struggle with that too. Paul says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has, who put a spell on you? That's what that means. Baskino, Baskino in the Greek. Who casts a spell upon you and puts you under their power to deceive you and seduce you? As soon as Paul left, somebody came in and preached another gospel and they were ready to run after them. Yeah. He says, who bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Listen, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth and crucified among you. You know what he's saying? Y'all saw Jesus crucified. Stay with me. You saw Jesus crucified. Wait a minute. He's talking to these are Gentiles. They weren't at Jesus crucifixion. But they saw it through the preaching of the gospel 
through the Old Testament scriptures so clearly and so vividly, it was as if they were there when he was crucified. That's what it means. That's what it means. Evidently set for you, that Greek term means it was the, the scene of Christ's crucifixion was, was put up like on a placard or a billboard. It was so big and so crystal clear, forewritten before their eyes as if they were there when Jesus was crucified. Why is that important? Because when they saw Jesus crucified, guess what they saw? Romans 7, 4, they saw themselves being crucified with Jesus. If you're a believer, you know what you're saying? When you say you're a Christian, you're saying, I've been crucified with Christ. Did you know that? What does that mean? That means you're dead to the law. You're not under the law anymore. Don't ever listen to a person that tells you, yeah, faith in Jesus is cool, cool, but you still got to watch what you eat. You still can't eat pork. Or you got to meet on this day. Or you got to do this work or deed or that or the other thing. They are lying to you. Faith in Christ is all you need to be justified before God. Does that make sense? It's not faith. It's not grace and works. It's grace alone. Yeah. Look, wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. See it? We died with Christ. That you should be married to another. Jesus is our, our, our heavenly hubby. Do y'all know that? Jesus is our heavenly husband. We're married to him now. We're not married to the law. Even to him who was raised from the what? Dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You can't bring forth fruit under the law. Only being married to Jesus can you bring forth fruit unto God, okay? Um, Galatians 3.2. Real quick, quick, quick. Look at the verse. Galatians 3.2 teaches us faith comes by hearing look this only what i learn of you did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith which would it be the latter the hearing of faith faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word right that's how they were born again through the hearing of the gospel not by any work that they did okay letter f christ's resurrection is commemorated we already talked about that first day of the week we're reminded that jesus christ rose again from the grave on the third day. And my closing letter, my closing letter is letter G. I want to leave you with this. These things are forfeited when this worship gathering is missed. Verse 24 and 25 are our closing verses for today. Look at verse 24. I want you to see Thomas's condition because he wasn't with the other 12 and watch what he was subject to. It says in verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, they said to Thomas, hey, hey, we've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Psst. that's my translation, Psst. <laughs> Psst. except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. That's what Thomas is saying. Thomas had a bad day, didn't he? But I appreciate his honesty, though. He didn't act like he had perfect faith. Like a lot of Christians act like they got perfect faith. They don't ever struggle with weak faith. Yes, you do. Yes, we do. Yes, you do. Thomas is saved like the rest of them, right? Just in this instance, he demonstrated weak faith. And he demonstrated weak faith because he wasn't there with the other disciples when Jesus came. That's Thomas's fault. He forsook the assembling of ourselves together. When you do that, you and I end up like Thomas. Unsure. Uncertain. Lacking in faith. I've never seen a Christian who has strong faith and bears a lot of fruit and is healthy and robust in their soul who regularly practices staying away from church. I ain't never seen it. I've never seen it. It's always the opposite. It's always the opposite. And when we miss the gathering of the saints together at the appointed times of worship, we actually put ourselves on the outside of the peace and the comfort and assurance that is ours to be had in Christ. And we forfeit it by neglect of the means of grace that God has so graciously given to the church that you and I might, listen, not only be saved, but know for sure that we're saved. I hope this helps somebody. I don't want any of you who are Christians to leave here doubting your salvation. God does not want you to doubt your salvation. Do we ever doubt our salvation? Yes. But that's not what God wants. Did you know you can be certain of your salvation? You can be sure of your salvation. And part of the way that God will solidify that and give you a deep down 
rock solid soul assurance that you're saved is primarily being under the preaching of the gospel where the spirit of God will speak to you and comfort you in a way that no other human being on the planet can comfort you. And the only one that can ultimately comfort you like that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. All right. We will uh, have our offering and then sing our last song. Then we'll have our music team come up. And we got a lot of food for you in the fellowship hall. Please save me a plate, please. All right. Have our music team come up. I'm, I was serious about that, too. I'm not laughing. Elias, give me that water, that water. Uh, please also do not leave. I have a very important announcement to make. If you were not here at the very beginning, I need everyone to hear this, okay? So please don't take off yet. <clears throat> okay, quick announcement before we sing our last song. We have a date for our next new members class. If you weren't here earlier, we mentioned it. Those of you that desire to become new members, we have a sign-up sheet for you on the piano, on, in, on the uh, piano in the dining room. And you can identify on there if you're a candidate for baptism or if you just want to become a new member. Our next class will be Saturday, April the 13th. And baptisms, Lord willing, will be Sunday, April the 21st. And if we need to do it the following week after that, we will. And then we have a members, new, uh, no, a members meeting Sunday, April the 14th. Okay, so we'll meet in here at 4 o'clock on that day. And then you can read the other announcements when you get time, okay? I just wanted to make sure I got those out for those that weren't here. Please stand. Let's sing our last song. grave. 